Welcome once again to our show and thank you for watching. This is Frank Gavalier, your host. I'm gonna thank everyone who makes this show possible. The Cable Access Network, CAN TV, who makes this and all the shows here possible from community and philanthropic and neighborhood, local uh, access for people who normally cannot ever be on TV. I wanna thank Pops, William Gadomski is on most all the shows here at Cable Access Network. Uh, Fred the Oak Tree Oak, and the San Patricios, uh, the big potatoes of uh, Chicago politics are also here, Name, uh, names unknown. So, well, a lot of people make this possible, but who really makes this possible is one of our guests, and that's uh, Sue Garza, and then also our viewing audience, because it's, you, without you, the show would not even be possible, and I really thank you for watching, and thank you for your emails, and your letters, and your calls, even when you're angry and you don't like what I'm saying or what our guest is saying, I appreciate all of your communication. Now, um, Sue, thank you for being on our show. Thanks for having me. Tell us briefly, who is Sue Garza? Tell us a little bit about, what's your biography in a couple of minutes? Okay, um, I'm Sue Sedlowski Garza. I grew up in the 10th Ward. I've been there for 55 years. Um, my family has been part of the Ward for over 140 years. My father is Edward. Wait, 140 years. 140 that's a, years. That's some good roots in a ward. Usually you say, I was born and raised there, but 140 years is uh, better than most. My great grandfather, McDillon, was actually born on the banks of the Wolf Lake in a log cabin. Uh, my, mo my mom's family is actually from that ward as well. Uh, I've been there my whole life. I went to school there, I work there. I actually work at the same school that I attended as a child. So you're a public school teacher? I am actually a CPS counselor. Oh, CPS counselor. CPS okay. counselor, yeah. I've been uh, working for CPS for 22 years. Uh, so let me get this straight. So you live in the, you uh, you went to this school. I went to that school. My mom went to that school. My children went to that school. And then you became a counselor and working at the school. Yep. So I've been inside the walls of Jane Adams Elementary for 46 years as a student, as a parent, and 22 years as an employee. Well, my dad says sometimes life works in a circle and you end up at the place you were the yeah, first in. Yeah, and mine has actually come full circle. You're okay. absolutely right. All and right. I live a block away from there as well. Okay. So. so you're very rooted in the community. Yes, yes very I am. Very strong roots. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and so a lot of people, they move in for, you know, the year before the election or move in for the election. Yeah. In your case, you are concrete, solid foundation and roots. I, there's a standing joke that my husband is going to bury me in the backyard of my home. So hopefully, that's how long I've been there. Hopefully not against your will. Um, True. <laughs> so... Um, so we better win the election so you don't get buried. Uh, we got to win this, you got to win this election. So, Absolutely. Uh, um, and of course the opponent is also welcome on the show. Everyone is welcome. Uh, so Alderman John Pope is welcome on the show and we'll give him a friendly and uh, uh, friendly show um, just like we are doing to this candidate. So first of all, let's start off with, uh, we're, we're being on your biography kind of as mm -hmm. a preliminary uh, preliminary action. So, are you, uh, so you're a family person, you're a wife. Yes, I've been married. Mother. Yep, I've been married with the same man for 29 years. That alone is an achievement in this yes, day and age. Yes, I'm very proud of that and still in love with him, by the way. Uh -huh. So there you go. If um, we had a viewing audience here, but I, I'm sure our TV audience is clapping right now. I'm sure they are. Um, I'm, I'm very blessed by, by the man that I'm with. So I have, we have four children, two wonderful, beautiful granddaughters. Uh, I'm, I'm very, I have a wonderful family. So a family person, somebody yes, rooted in family. and very much. Okay, traditional my husband family is values. A, yep, my husband is uh, one of six. He comes from a very big extended family. He's related to, it seems like, every Latino in the ward. So, okay. yeah, right. very big family. Good, good. So um, my next question is, if you could tell our viewing audience mm -hmm. where your office is, a phone number, and website. Yeah, sure. Um, our office is located at 9510 Ewing. We actually just opened two satellite offices. One is at 8702 Commercial, and the other one is on 132nd and Brandon in Hegwish. Okay. And our telephone number is 773-322-2679. And our website is ssgarza.com, like okay. to ship. Why don't you tell our viewing audience this one more time, and this will also play throughout the show on the bottom of the screen. Okay, um, our website is ssgarza.com. 
Our campaign office is located at 9510 South Ewing Avenue, E-W-I-N-G. Uh, we also have another office on the, on the north end of the ward, which is 8702 Commercial. And we also have a, another ward office on the south end of the ward at 132nd and Brandon. Well, you have quite a bit of office. You have three offices for this one ward. Well, it's a very big ward, one of the biggest. It's, I think our ward is huge. Biggest one in the city? Biggest ward in the city, okay. yep. Biggest ward in the city. And, and just as some background, it's a very storied ward of uh, history. Yes. Uh, the steel mills mm -hmm. um, at one time between Northwest and Indiana and, and the southeast side of Chicago, mm -hmm. you had a huge amount of uh, jobs, kind of Rust Belt, now Rust Belt, but at the yeah. time just vibrant, active economy. We were a true mill town. Um, we had nine steel mills. Uh, U.S. Steel alone employed close to, at the peak of their time, employed over 10,000 guys. They had a hospital in there, a grocery, a commissary. I mean, it, it was it was like a little town within a, you know, city within a, in a mill. So uh, once the mills closed, Wisconsin Steel closed, LTV closed, Acme Steel closed, U.S. Steel closed, closed, so the jobs went too, so. We are left, you know, you, you made reference to a Rust Belt. We are kind of like a, a, a community that's just been forgotten, not just because of jobs, just, but the southeast side of the city is really forgotten by downtown. We really, we don't have anything there. So it went from a uh, high employment and high wage, mm -hmm. guys with a blue, mostly guys, but some gals, but mostly guys who had high wage jobs that yep. they could send their kids Sundays to Catholic schools, have a summer home, mm -hmm. um, you go on vacation, health insurance, pensions, yep. that kind of lifestyle. You know, maybe a small bungalow, but still a nice home. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes a summer home, nice car, big metal American car, yep. kind of the American dream that was known even when I was a boy uh, that then started to die, I think, in the 70s and the 80s. Right. I mean, we were a vibrant neighborhood. You right. know, it, there was a, a restaurant or a tavern on every corner that would go nonstop. I mean, they were, you know, places would close for an hour, clean up and open right back up, getting ready for the, for the second or the third shift. And the same was true for <clears throat> Northwest Indiana. Yeah. Absolutely. Because there was kind harbor, of harbor, yeah. It was similar, a lot of same ethnic groups to immigrants who came, whether yes. they were from Serbia or Poland or Italy or Ireland or Croatia. Um, it was a true Mexico, melting pot. Uh, yeah. And you had a melting pot. A lot of immigrants mm -hmm. came here and you, you know, if you had strong back and whirling the work, you could make a good living. You know, uh, we instead of college fairs, when I was in high school, the mills would come. Um, and do mill fairs. I mean, there would literally be nine steel mills trying to recruit high school seniors to go to straight to work in the mill. And it wasn't uncommon for students not to go to college, they'd go straight to the mill because like you said, it was a good paying job. And, and, you, can, and you could make a good living, you make oh, yeah. a good life, you know, Absolutely. good life. And a sense yeah. of community, a neighborhood, you know, strong, you know, these are famous oh, yeah. neighborhoods. And of course it had famous politicians. Yes, uh, it did. Edward Verdoliak, chairman of the Democratic Party, famous mm -hmm. or infamous, depending on people's point of view, was kind of uh, on the TV every night in the Absolutely. 70s and the 80s. Yeah. Consul Wars, Harold yep. Washington versus Verdoliak and all mm -hmm. that. Uh, but it seems like after that time, uh, kind of people forgot about the 10th Ward for a long period of time. Right. I mean, we were always in the news for something. You're absolutely right. right. And then when Wisconsin Steel closed and guys showed up to work one day and the, the gate was locked, they couldn't even empty their locker. Some guys had 42 years in that mill and they lost their pension. So there was a big job, um, <clears throat> a big push for uh, our Save Our Jobs Committee, um, Save Our Pensions. There was a lawsuit that was settled that some of the guys, they did get part of their pension back, but not all. <clears throat> and we were, we are still, I believe, the forgotten entity of the city. So international economics came in, free mm -hmm. trade came in, and people started to manufacture steel or steel products or iron products yep, elsewhere. elsewhere. Right. Um, Philippines, Mexico, yep. other nations, other states, um, rather than Northwest Indiana and the south side of Chicago. Mm -hmm. Now you still do have some manufacturing down there. You have, I think, one of the oldest um, Ford plants, right? Some yep. of the car manufacturing. You had, you had other car manufacturers, but I think you still have the Ford manufacturer that creates the Taurus and the new Lincoln. I always forget the, 
is it MWK, MRK, one of the, <laughs> but I, and I think they make a police car down there, but I know they make the Ford Taurus and the new Lincoln car. We do have a Ford plant there, yeah, right. and we do have like a parts, um, a, a big addition that was put on on Avenue O that's it's not on Torrance that is like a, a plant for they, they manufacture parts and stuff there too. But essentially you have tons of vacant land and yes. tons of unused but are probably need environmental remediation of still oh, yeah, mills. Absolutely. Uh, is there one operating still or some, maybe operating for some other purpose? I thought there was one that's still operating out of all those. There, There's no mills that are operating. One, uh, the old Republic Steel is now a recycling plant. Um, the there's pet we do have we're lucky enough to have you know KCBX is now has a is a pet coke storage unit that's where all the pet coke is stored from BP um, but we don't have any steel mills that are running down there no okay. mm -mm. but there isn't there's still some in Northwest Indiana oh yeah Northwest Indiana still has a yeah US they're still running there but that's you know on the outs it's not within our ward no okay. um, and Bethlehem still used to be I believe there. Right. In, in Northwest, Northwest Indiana, Indiana. Mm -hmm. okay. U.S. Steel, yeah. So, I mean, and famous companies, because Bethlehem Steel, I believe, used to be owned by Joseph Kennedy, or he was one of the main investors, and, you know, things that, uh, these are the things that uh, that fuel the war, the war engine of World War II. Oh, yeah, I absolutely. I mean, they fueled World absolutely. War II and economic growth and prosperity and uh, winning the war in World War II, and then suddenly, it became, well, maybe not suddenly, it might have been a slower death, but people might not have seen it suddenly. It, 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 it. They're on a skeleton crew there. I know that they, they've been in the process of laying some guys off. There are, I, I think, believe one of their blast furnaces is still running. I'm not really sure what they still do there, per se, but um, it's not anywhere near what it used to be. Now, can we bring that kind of manufacturing back? And if we can't, then what do we replace it with? Well, that's a great question, Frank. I, I don't know if we can ever get back to the days, you know, the glory days of all the mills running. I mean, mm -hmm. with the whole NAFTA Act and everything, th things I don't think can ever be what they used to be. They're manufacturing, as you say, in other countries for probably less than half the price of what we're gonna, what we would do it here. So most of these companies have moved with the Free Trade Act. Mm -hmm. And so what do you want to replace it with? What are your ideas? So you have all these giant, metal buildings and uh, well, the equipment. buildings are mostly torn down now yeah. there's it's just it's land, just vacant just land. vacant land I mean for instance on the north end of the ward we have six where US Steel once stood the ore wall is still there mm -hmm. um, but we have 600 acres of undeveloped lakefront um, there is a proposal there that f for a lakeside development um, that's going to bring, you know, new homes, homes on the lake with boat slips and a shopping center. Um, we're pushing actually part of our, my campaign as well as <clears throat> the other candidates that, that were in the cam campaign too is we'd really like to see a trauma center there. Um, we don't have a trauma center on the south side. We have to be transported. If somebody's hurt, seriously hurt, they have to go all the way to Little um, Christ Community, so, which is a pretty you know, fair distance away. Uh, we need we need world class schools in our neighborhood. We don't have any world class schools. A selective enrollment high school would be great. Now, if you made this proposal for houses on the lake and shopping center, wouldn't there be a huge cost of environmental remediation? Yeah, we didn't make the proposal. Right. <coughs> this, the proposal that's out there. Yeah, the yeah, I Yes, there has to be a lot of remediation. I mean, perhaps hundreds of millions of dollars. Absolutely. So. Solo Cup was supposed to come. Um, they were given $17.2 million to do some, uh, to build there, but they never came. Yet they got the money. It came from the tax increment financing. So They never paid it back? No. That's crazy. Crazy. $17.2 million could have really went into a lot and of my understanding the solo cup jobs would have been relatively low paying jobs also right right but mm -hmm. they were slated to come but they never did so so how can we clean up that area environment because you also have a lot of dumps transit stations dumps you used to and yep. without naming particular elected officials there were elected officials there that allowed that to happen yes um, that uh, you know represented them or allowed it whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. without pointing fingers, but they're there. So what can we do to make sure you don't have the same environmental impact? Because my understanding is you have higher rates of asthma. 
Oh, the uh, asthma rates. The asthma higher rates, rates of, of cancer. Yeah, we're in a cancer alley where we live. Mm -hmm. I mean, the rates of cancer are astronomical compared to other parts of the city or even the state. Um, we have uh, KCBX actually is there and they're operate, like I was telling you earlier, they store the pet coke from the BP plant. And um, it's, it's literally yards away from residential homes. So that's a problem. We also have Agrifine, which is a f basically like a fertilizer plant that um, uses animal par carcasses and parts to make their product. That's in a residential area as well. Um, we don't really have any, the industry that is there is causing us to live with environmental hazards, and that's not what we want. Now, why is the industry in residential areas when there seems to be vast swaths of land that are not residential? That's a really good question. We've never been asked what we want. Right. We've never been asked, you know, we've never been part of the decision-making process. The residents in the 10th Ward have never had a say in what's come to the 10th Ward, and that's one of the things that um, I'd like to change. I think that people in the 10th Ward have a really, they have great ideas. Uh, they have, you know, we can work together to, to brainstorm and bring some other things to the Ward other than fertilizer plants and pet coke. Well, pet coke creates all sorts of hazards and yeah. it seems like the residents do not want it from what I see. You know, I, I go on that Southeast side uh, Facebook page. Southeast Environmental Task Force, they've done a great job, and, they really and, have. And it seems like, the, you know, me, most of the residents do not want pet coke there. Um, I would say 99.9% .9 of the residents do not want pet coke there. So who's the other 2%, the mayor and the aldermen? It the seems aldermen. like it. I mean, they're right now they're, they're talking about that, you know, they're gonna get it out of there. And I think it's an election ploy. You know, once the election comes, they, oh, I'm sorry, we changed our mind. So what's the difference between you and the incumbent? So, you know, you have the incumbent, <coughs> and sometimes mm -hmm. people don't like an incumbent, but you have to give them a reason why they should vote for you rather than the incumbent. Well, I think the biggest difference between myself and the incumbent is I trust people. And I think if you give the people of the 10th Ward the opportunity to, to be part of the decision-making process, and to be part of you know being able to run the ward, like I said earlier, they'll come up with some really great and innovative ideas to make the ward a better place. Um, the incumbent is old school, right? He doesn't believe that people can be part of the decision-making process. He doesn't believe that they know what they want. And most of his city council votes have come from conversations with the mayor, not from conversations with the the citizens of the 10th Ward. Now, one, one concern about the mayor, and this isn't about the mayor, but one concern about mm -hmm. the mayor is that he's more of a downtown lakefront mayor, you know, more involved with people, kind of an upper echelon of wealth. Is the mayor engaged in the 10th Ward enough to advise the alderman what he wants to do? Well, one of the things, Frank, is I believe that the mayor knows that we have 600 acres of undeveloped lakefront. There's no other place in the city that has that. That is, could be a huge development, a huge money maker. Um, I've been working with Alliance of the Southeast and we've been asking for a community benefits agreement on the development in, on that parcel of land. And so far, the mayor, the incumbent, and the developer will not let the people have a seat at the table. And I think that's detrimental to our ward. Who is the developer? McCaffrey. Okay. And how, do, how were they chosen to be the developer? Good question. We haven't been part of the process at all. Yeah. So who owned the land? So the steel US companies- U.S. Steel. Oh, U.S. Steel owned mm -hmm. the land. So mm -hmm. after this, the steel companies went out of business, they still maintained the land? Yeah, okay. they did. They right. probably got a tax write-off too for it. Oh, I'm sure they did. Yeah. I'm sure they did. Yeah. So, so you, you want to engage the community and you want the community to be part of the decision-making process. Absolutely. Uh, some of the best people I've ever met are from the 10th Ward. Uh, you know, they're brilliant. I, I would, I'm not, I, I'm not uh, that egotistical where I wouldn't. I, I believe engaging people makes them uh, want to get involved in, the, in, more, you know, in the decision-making process in the Ward by letting them be part of the decision-making process. They'll take an active role in, the, in their neighborhood and they'll know that their voice really matters. As I knock doors, people tell me all the time, mm, 
my voice doesn't matter anyway. They don't care what I say. Okay. So I want to turn that around. And I think you're right about the community benefits agreement. I was had another mm -hmm. alderman on the show before you before you came, Alderman Howard Brookins. And he said that when Walmart came to his ward, and Walmart's not my favorite form of economic development, he said nothing was there. And I agree with him that something's better than nothing. But he said that they got a community benefits agreement, mm -hmm. including contracting and employment side. So mm -hmm. he said that they have an African-American uh, security company um, there. They said they had two African-American construction companies, and they have the restaurant in the Walmart in the 21st Ward is a local-owned business. Oh, that's not, great. Not, uh, not just a subway or a pizza place, a, a restaurant, you know, Local. from the community with food that, you know, um, that the community would be interested in, uh, as well as um, jobs for people in the community, including ex-felons. Oh, they, that's great. So they had a community benefits agreement. It would seem to me logical that any large development in any ward Mm -hmm. should have a community benefits agreement for local residents. I agree. I agree Especially 100%. in areas that are low income or have suffered through economic changes due to international changes of economics and, and changes of free trade proposals and, and the new international economy, such as the 10th Ward. I agree 100%. Because there was no help after the still mills no. came down. No, none. And a community, a community benefits agreement will actually ensure that we can also profit from the development, not just the developers and the, you know, the big businesses. Right. Absolutely. Now, what your experience as a school counselor, being in a public school system, being a counselor, mm -hmm. uh, one, what do you see in that? Like, what is your perspective? So you deal with kids, maybe they're at risk, maybe they're, you're, mm -hmm. and then how does it help you be a better alderman? Well, being a counselor, actually, one of my biggest uh, qualities, I believe, is, is I'm a really good listener. And our current alderman doesn't listen at all. He never even asks. So that, that's an issue to me. I'm a leader. I'm area vice president for the Chicago Teachers Union. Uh, so I'm a leader. I'm not afraid to stand up for what's right. Um, I deal with, for the past 22 years, I've dealt with hundreds of families in the 10th Ward. Um, and I, I know the problems that they face. I, I, I live it every day. And I'm, I'm a problem solver, so I help them solve their problems. Uh, as area vice president for the Chicago Teachers Union, that job encompasses 69 schools. Every school within the 10th Ward is in my area. So I don't just deal with families and people within my school. I deal with people in other schools as well throughout the 10th Ward. Okay. Now, uh, how would you organize your ward office that may be differently than the incumbent or other aldermen? Well, my ward office is going to be reflective of the community, and um, I'm, I'm going to form committees to help me uh, review right away. As soon as I take office, I'm going to inform standing committees to take a look at the state of our ward, and that those committees will be reflective of uh, business owners, church um, people from the church, clergy, uh, homeowners, renters, small business owners. Um, we really need to take a hard look at how this ward has been run for the past 16 years because nobody, we don't, no one really has an insight into how that's being dealt with. Um, I think my staff at my at the uh, office needs to be reflective of the community, not just Afri not just uh, Caucasian. It needs to have Latinos and African American and men and women, and people from every aspect of the city of our ward. Now, uh, some aldermanic candidates did not endorse for mayor, but you mm -hmm. did choose to endorse for mayor. Yes. First, who did you endorse for mayor? I endorsed Jesus Chuy, Chuy Garcia 100%. And then why did you endorse him? I endorsed Chuy Garcia because our, a lot of our positions and our values align. We stand, uh, the, we have the same values and the same uh, positions on public education, on privatizing city services. And I also, um, we both of us also believe that um, the wealth should be sp spread around evenly in every neighborhood <laughs> in the city, not just the select few. Um, the current alderman uh, has not come out publicly endorsed anybody, but um, it's really interesting to me because uh, he's gotten tens of thousands of dollars from the mayor's uh, friends and their political uh PAC fund uh, Chicago forward. So, uh, but yet he talks to people on the doors and say, says that he's with Chewy. So 
Right. I'm anxious to see if he would come up publicly and say somebody. Well, I'm also impressed that you seem to be a consensus builder that there were a number of candidates who ran in your ward mm -hmm. uh, and that all of them, besides obviously the incumbent who didn't make the runoff are now endorsing you. One of them, noted, of course, is Rich Martinez. Yes. Who ran before, very, made a very strong showing against Pope last time getting, I think, close to 40 percent of the vote, 30, somewhere in that range and uh, has been out there, has a very good crew and some very good ideas. Mm -hmm. So it seems that you've integrated people that, not that you're, not necessarily they're running against you because they're all running for that position and most of them are running against Pope, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, you've got them on your side now. Yeah, I'm actually very proud. I'm very proud to stand beside these people, um, the people that, my, the other candidates that ran against Pope as well. Um, we've all been together. Uh, I've gotten endorsements publicly from two of the top vote getters that garnered 20 percent of the vote and I'm working very closely with the other candidates as well and their supporters to bring our message about the 10th Ward there so to bring uh, our message to the 10th Ward. I think that shows leadership skills as well as coalition building and being oh, a yeah, consensus builder. Absolutely and I, we're all working together cohesively uh, it's and I commend them as well because it, it's you know they ran a great race they really did, and everybody r brings something to the table. And I hope to continue that relationship after I win as well. If you were elected older man, what would be the first thing that you did? The first thing that or I- Or the first thing that you do? The first thing that I do would um, be, f would, I would form committees. And I would form committees on, uh, with, on a, a women's committee, a, a committee on youth, a committee on education, senior citizens, crime, um, just to be able to collaborate. And I, I want to unite the 10th Ward. Um, one of the biggest things, we have seven little neighborhoods within the 10th Ward and we're, we're all so divided. And I don't believe that that's on accident. Um, the incumbent wants to keep us divided to maintain political control. Um, and I want to work really hard and I think I'm modeling that right now by having er all the other candidates. We're all working together for the same goal to better the important. 10th Ward. We're almost out of time. Can you tell our viewing audience one more time mm -hmm. your office address and your website and how to contact you uh, by email or, or telephone? Sure. Um, our ward office is 9510 Ewing, E W I N G. Our website is ssgarza.com. And our email is Susan Sedlowski Garza at gmail.com. What's your punch number? 52. 52. 52 is Sue. Thank you very much for watching. I appreciate it. Thank you for coming, and goodbye, and God bless.